ಶ್ರೀಶೈಲೇಶದಯಾಪಾತ್ರಂ ದೀಭಕ್ತಿಯಾದಿಗುಣಾರ್ಣವಂ ಯತೀಂದ್ರ ಪ್ರವಣಂ ವಂದೇ ರಮ್ಯಜಾತರ ಮುನಿ ಲಕ್ಷ್ಮೀನಾಥ ಸಂಭಾಂ ನಾಥಯಾಮುನ ಮಧ್ಯಮ ಅಸ್ಮದಾಚಾರ್ಯಪರ್ಯಂತ ವಂದೇ ಗುರುಪರಂಪರಾ ಯೋ ನಿತ್ಯಂ ಅಚ್ಯುತ ಪದಾಂಬುಜಯುಗ್ಮರುಗ್ಮವ್ಯಾಮೋಹತಸ್ತಿತರಾಣಿ ತೃಣಾಯಮೇನೆ ಅಸ್ಮದ್ಗುರೋರ್ ಭಗವತೋಸ್ಯ ದೈಕಸಿಂಧೋ ರಾಮಾನುಜಸ್ಯ ಚರಣೌ ಶರಣ ಪ್ರಪದ್ಯೇ ಲೋಕಾಚಾರ್ಯಾ ಗುರವೇ ಕೃಷ್ಣಪಾದಸೂನವೇ ಸಂಸಾರ ಭೋಗಿ ಸಂದಷ್ಟ ಜೀವ ಜೀವಾತವೇ ನಮಃ Asmat Guru Bhyan Maha, Asmat Parama Guru Bhyan Maha, Asmat Sarva Guru Bhyan Maha, I offer my respects to all of my teachers. Before we begin, I always do that. And uh, what we're going to do now is we're going to chant the, uh, I'm going to chant the Pranam Mantras or the Tanians of uh, Manavala Mahamuni and Hila Lukacharya. So let's have a look at those. Shri Shailesha Daya Patram Deepak Yari Guranavam Yudhindram Paravam Bande Rami Jama Taramunim ಲೋಕಾಚಾರ್ಯ ಗುರವೇ ಕೃಷ್ಣಪಾರ ಶೂನವೆ ಸಂಸಾರ ಭೋಗಿ ಸಂದಸ್ತ ಜೀವ ಜೀವಾತವೇ ಜೀವಾತವೇ ನಮಃ ಸೊ ವಿರ್ ಕಂಟಿನ್ಯೂಯಿಂಗ್ ಆನ್ ವಿತ್ ಅವರ್ ಡಿಸ್ಕಷನ್ ಆಫ್ ಚತ್ವ ಟ್ರಾಯಂ ವಿಚ್ ಇಸ್ ಒನ್ ಆಫ್ ದಿ ಏಟೀನ್ ರಹಸ್ಯ ಗ್ರಂಥಸ್ ಓರ್ ಬುಕ್ಸ್ ಆಫ್ ಎಸಿಟರಿಕ್ ಸೀಕ್ರೆಟ್ ಅಂಡರ್ಸ್ಟ್ಯಾಂಡಿಂಗ್ about the about the three secret mantras um by pila lokacharya tatva trayam is of course about three principles three vedantic principles in vishishta dvaita vedanta chit achit and ishvara so without further ado let's continue on with uh looking at the at the text here uh we got up to the prologue the prologue starts off like this the tatra try is a typical theistic exposition of the sri vaishnava or the hmm, there's a there's some typos here it should be vishishta dvaita school of philosophical thought they've written vashishta dvaita okay the founder of the again typo it should be vishishta dvaita school of is ramanuja acharya loka acharya or as he's known colloquially as Pillai Lokacharya. Um, the author of this work, of the, of the work, is his follower. He belongs to the 13th century. Varavara Muni, also known in Tamil as Manavalama Munigal, uh, 14th to 15th century, has given an elucidatory um, and helpful commentary in Sanskrit on the type of triad. um i'm not quite sure whether that's in sanskrit or mani pravala which is a mixture of sanskrit and tamil <clears throat> there are three chapters in this book the first deals with the meaning and the nature of the soul chit chit means consciousness and knowledge and how these concepts are in vish again uh, spelling mistake vishishta dvaita school differ from those of other schools of thought such as advaita vedanta which is the school of shankara uh sankhya and jaina jaina means jainism so in the second chapter the th- the three kinds of non sentient things that is achit right those things that don't have consciousness that is surasattva nishrasattva and sattva sunya and how evolution takes place i discussed in the third chapter the essential nature of god his auspicious qualities his different forms and the intimate relationship between the devotee and god are discussed vishishta advaita school of thought expresses a religious reaction against the advaita vedanta or the non dualism otherwise known as monism of shankara the ideology expressed in the tatva triya inspires devotion and is one of the finest examples of love and devotion between god and man one becomes one with the supreme by total submission to his will the lord himself is also guided only by his will which is called satya santopa three factors of the soul chit 
three factors of the soul, chit, matter, achit, and God, Ishwara, are regarded as equally ultimate and real. The first two kinds of real, that is the soul and matter, are totally dependent on the third kind of real, that is Ishwara. Ishwara is the supreme soul and also the soul of the souls and the whole cosmos is his body. So somebody in the chat said, my understanding is that Ramanuja is not the founder of the Shishta Dvaita, but uh, the one who formalized it, yeah, or systematized it, correct. Because Yamunachari also preached this type of Vedanta, is that correct? Yes. And would you say that earlier Acharyas and Yamuna also preached along these lines of, of uh, the Shishta Dvaita? Yes, that's true. In fact, uh, Yamunacharya, otherwise known as Alavanda, who was guru, or we can say Param Guru of the, the guru of, of Ramanuja's guru, uh, Peri Nambi or Mahapuna. Um, he was, he wrote, he wrote some books and he, one of the books that he wrote was the Siddhi Triya. Siddhi Triya is much, very much like Tattva Triya. So we are studying Tattva Triya by Pila Lakacharya. But many years before that was written the Siddhi Triya. Siddhi Triya also talks about Ishwara Siddhi, Samvit Siddhi, and uh, Chit, uh, uh, also talks about these three tattvas. So no doubt Vishishtadvaita was in, was in vogue before, before Ramanuja and Ramanuja systematized it. Ramanuja speaks in the beginning of his Sri Bhasha. His commentary on Vedanta Sutras, he says that uh, uh, before, before, bef you know, I, I took, you know, I took this system from the ancient commentators like Bodhayana, uh, Guhadev, Karpardin, um, Tanka. These are these are the names, some of the names that he that he that he quotes. Okay, so let's continue on. The first two kinds, okay, Ishra is the supreme. Yes, here, here is a, it, it's being explained here in the third sentence here of this paragraph about the concept of Sharira Shariri Baba, that the idea is uh, uh, Ramanuja's uh, philosophy in English can be called panentheism. It means all in God. Pan means all, n means in, the, the is a, theos means God. So all in God. So if we think of the, of all of creation as of, as the body of God, then God is the soul of the whole of creation. Uh, that that uh, is an analogy which um, which Ramanuja gives. It's called Sharira Shariri Baba. Sharira is the body. Shariri is the maintainer, controller, and owner of the body. That is the soul. So um, the living beings, Chit and Achit, the uh, insentient beings, the insentient things of the universe, the material nature, right, are considered to be like the body of God, and God is like the soul, because, because the living beings and the universe are not only created by God and controlled by God and supported by God, but they are pervaded also by God. So um, in, in every way, God acts like the soul, because the soul supports and pervades with consciousness the body. So this is the relationship that, that, how, that Ramanuja gives to these, these different realities, and he, this is how he explains it. So here he says, Ishwara is the supreme soul, and also the soul of souls, and the whole cosmos is his body. The relationship between soul and matter and God is of the nature of the relationship between the body and the soul. As the Visheshanas, Visheshanas, uh, the word vishesha means special or it means vish or specific, it can mean specific. So vishishta advaita also can mean the advaita or the non-dualism or the monism of the, the oneness, but specific oneness, vishishta advaita, that certain things are one and certain things are different. So as the visheshanas or the subordinate qualities or the dependent elements cannot exist separately without the whole of which they are the qualities. So there are, there are qualities. For example, you have a you have brown cow. It's an animal which has certain attributes of a cow, 
also also is of brown color. So those attributes of the cow, like having an udder, or 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 having horns, or uh, having a tail, right, um, are also there. And also the fact that it's brown is a, it's the color brown. So these are all attributes. But the attributes don't exist by themselves. They only ad adhere into the substance. So they don't exist separately. In the same way. The first two kinds of real cannot exist independently of God or Ishra. The souls and the universe cannot independently exist without, without God, just like the body, the material body can't exist without the soul. When the soul leaves the body, the body deteriorates. The complete and complex whole, including all, is a unity. Okay, so it's a complex unity, this, this relationship. Ramanuj is a realist. When, Ram, when he says, when they say here Ramanuj is a realist, they're saying that Ramanuja, as well as other Vaishnava Charyas, and even some other uh, philosophers in India, are what we call Parinamavad people. They belong, to the, the word Vada means a, a philosophy. It means I, uh, what I talk about. What I talk about is, the, is that specific doctrine. The doctrine is. The doctrine is Parinama. Parinama vibe means that, that the world and the souls are real emanations and real uh, expansions or conversions of God. They're, they're real. Whereas Adi Shankara has a philosophy where he says, Brahma Satyam Jagat Mitya. Brahma, only spirit is real. And uh, the rest of it, everything else, there's one, um, there's one attributeless spirit called Brahman and everything else is unreal. So all of the difference that we see around us between ourselves and other pieces of things in the universe, right? All the difference that we see is actually an illusion and there is no difference actually. So that's, uh, uh, that's a Shankara's idea. So that's why they call Shankara a non-realist. He's not, he's not a realist. That type of philosophy is not called Parinamavad, but it is called Vaivartavad. Okay, so anyway, enough about that because but anyway, Ramanuja is a realist. He believes in the reality of the world. And his realist, realistic position clarifies some difficulties contained in the monistic idealism of Shankara. Yeah, exactly. Because, there, because when we say that the world doesn't exist, the soul doesn't exist, then things become a little difficult to explain. Um, Shankara leads us to believe that the complete identity of, of Atman and in the complete identity, you know, exact identity of Atman and Brahman, the word Atman can mean different things. It can mean, usually it means the Jeeva Atman or the individual soul, but it can also mean the Paramatman, the supreme soul. Uh, here he's just used the word Atman. And so um, the complete identity of the Atman with Brahman. But Ramanuja upholds a distinction between the two, the devotee and Ishwara. So here he's also using the word Atman in the sense of the Jeeva Atman the individual soul. Okay, understood. Uh, the humble devotee thinks very high of, of his Lord, and uh, that is why he is led to devotion. Hmm. He cannot conceive himself as identical with God. There is a distinction and a separation between the two. It is only this sense of separation that includes the devotee and urges him to, to seek the, the Lord and fully yield to him for his graciousness. Right. Um, apparently, these authors um, have constantly used the word Vashishta Dvaita, which is not a word uh, for Vishishta Dvaita. In the Vishishta Dvaita system, the world is real and not Maya. The word Maya in Sanskrit, Ma means not. If I say na or ma in Sanskrit, it means not. And ya, yaha means that. Yaha means that, so not that. So when, 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 I, when I see something and I say, no, that's not that, that's not that, that's not that, that means it, there's some illusion. It, it refers to illusion. So the word maya means illusion. It's made up of two words, ma and ya. So it's a compound, as uh, conceived by Shankara. So... Shankara thinks that the world, not exactly that the world is Maya, is an illusion. The, 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 the differences, the differences in the world is, is, is an illusion, according to Shankara. The world is Brahman, according to Shankara. 
it is something, but it is a non-differentiated near guna. It is a thing without any qualities. And so if we see qualities and difference in it, that's an, that, that is an illusion. The, soul, <clears throat> the souls are also real. Okay, so what he's saying here basically is he's saying, okay, Ramanuja believes in reality. He's a realist. He believes God is real. He believes the souls are real and he believes the world is real. He believes all of these three are real. Their identity or unification with God, meaning the souls and, the, and, and matter, and the universe, um, with God is sought by the, an analysis of the absolute, Ishwara. And uh, there is unity between, uh, both between what is the subject, what is subject to change, matter, and what is without ch any change, chit. So the, the difference between chit and achit here is being highlighted. One difference is that we see matter go through different changes, the soul doesn't change, right? This is highlighted in the Bhagavad Gita by Lord Krishna when he says, Dehe no yata dehe, kolvaram yovaram jara. Kolvaram means uh, boyhood, yovaram means youthhood, jara means old age. So although the body ages and we experience boyhood, youthhood and old age, the soul doesn't age, the soul remains the same. <clears throat> So there is a clear analysis of the relationship between the body and the soul. The cosmos, matter, and the souls are the body of God since they are both subservient to him and Ishwara has the privilege of governing them. The material changes occur in, the, in God's body and are teleological. That is, the body is a means to the soul. They're connected. Thus, the world which is the body of God, is an instrument of God, right? Is an instrument of God, Upakarna. So they, uh, the self, the self has no extension, but being located in the heart, right? So sometimes we read this in the, we read this that the self is, is uh, there's actually in the Upanishads a description of the, of the human heart as being like an inverted lotus bud. If you have a lotus flower, which is closed up like a bud, if we close all the petals up and we turn it upside down, it looks very much like a human heart. Um, so so the, the idea of the ancients was that the, heart, that the soul resided within the heart. When, when we read heart, you know, we can also translate the same thing as mind, right? We, we tend to think of the consciousness as being situated in the head or the mind. Um, it you know, doesn't really matter if what, where we believe the center of consciousness is in the body. Um, for for the sake of uh, for the sake of following what the shastra says here, what the scripture says here, they say the heart. Okay, the heart region. All right. So, but being located in the heart, it has a connection with the body. Due to this separations, so, excuse me. Due to this, sensations are felt in the different parts of the body. So the the uh, the consciousness, the soul, right pervades the whole body with its consciousness. And therefore, if I prick my finger or if I stub my toe, you know, I feel that even though uh, the soul itself is considered to be atomic and situated in either the heart or the mind, wherever you want to think the soul is situated, but the, the, the consciousness of the soul pervades the whole body. It doesn't pervade more than the body, um, I don't feel what you feel. If you prick your finger, I don't feel it. So therefore, there's a limit to the consciousness right now of the soul, and that is the body. So due, uh, due, due to this, the self, has, the self has no extent. Okay, due to this, sensations are felt in different parts of the body. An entity is required to bridge the gap. So some sort of idea how do how do how is the soul minute or or uh, infinitesimal, and how does it, how does the soul's consciousness pervade the, the body? So this is this is this this uh, concept is called dharma bhuta jnana, dharma ad bhuta jnana. They put here dharma bhuta jnana, but it's actually dharma ad bhuta jnana. Uh, the attributive intelligence dharma bhuta jnana, and this is an ex a capable of extension. There is a logical necessity to postulate such, such an entity as the attributive intelligence, right? So we're still in the, in the prologue here. So this will all be explained in 
more detail when we get into the actual text, which is very soon. From the theological point, uh, point of view, it proves the omniscience of God, showing that his attributive intelligence is pervasive over the whole, the whole of the cosmos. So that's something that we have in common with God. We have attributed consciousness, and he also has attributed consciousness. His attributed consciousness is now is completely expanded to all places or you know, throughout because he pervades everything. From the philosophical point of view, it provides constancy, constancy to the, the spirit. The soul and God are similar intrinsically, but the soul, the soul is God-like and remains dependent on God. So the difference, what he's highlighting one difference. There are several differences between the soul and God. One is that the soul is dependent on God. God is independent. So in Sanskrit, this is called, independence is called Swatantra, and dependence is called Paratantra. The soul is Paratantra, and the um, uh, Ishwara, or the God, is, the, is Paratantra. Uh, sorry, excuse me, Ishwara God is Swatantra. The soul is paratantra. The, the causation theory of satkaryavad, what I just said, parinamavad, that is also sometimes called satkaryavad. Sat means eternality. Karya means uh, what is you know the what is done, right? Karya, the effect, the effect, the the eternal effect. The effect is actually eternal, right? Because Brahman is the cause, uh, is the cause. God is the cause of everything, and the universe and the souls are the effect, right? Just like there's a potter, and a potter takes a lump of clay, and he makes a pot out of it, like that. So there are two causes for the pot. There's the clay, which is the material cause of the pot. Without the, ma the material, the potter cannot make a pot. And then there is the, <clears throat> there, there is the potter. The potter is also a, a cause of the pot because the potter shapes the clay. So the pot has two causes. It has what we call the, the uh, nimitta karana and the upadana karana. The upadana karana means the, um, the clay, and the nimitta karana is the potter who shapes the clay. In the case of the universe and the souls, God is both the potter and the clay. He is the one who shapes or creates the souls in the universe, and he also creates them out of himself because there is nothing else. In the beginning, in the in the in the Vedas, it's described Narayana Brahmo Jayate, Narayana Dindro Jayate, Narayana Pajapati E Pajayante, Asanityo Narayana, Shivascha Narayana, Shakascha Narayana. So before Shiva, before before Indra, before Brahma, there was Narayana. Right. So he's the origin. So the changes occur only in the attributes, right? So the, the cause never changes, the attributes change. Well, the, the substance doesn't change, the attributes change, the visheshanas. And the whole appears to be undergoing modifications. In fact, the substance, visheshya, right? So there's two things here, visheshya and visheshana. Visheshya is the attributes. Visheshana is the, are the, are the attributes. Vishesha is the substance in which the attributes adhere in here. So um, uh, it does not change. So the substance does not change. That substance, we have a footnote here for some reason. What does that mean? Substance which serves as the substratum of change. So the substance doesn't change, but it's a substratum for change. It's the, it's the, it's the, uh, it, it's the, it allows for change to, to occur, okay, in its attributes. Oops, where do we miss? Where do we miss? Okay, the substance is God. Thus, there is, there is change neither in God nor in the soul, but it is the attributive intelligence or Dhamma Dhritigana, which makes modifications possible. The matter changes. Ishra includes the entire universe, all its spiritual material elements. Ishra is the cause and also the effect. In dissolution or pralaya, so we have creation, we have maintenance, and we have destruction. Right? We have different stages right, of the attributes because the attributes change. Um, the whole universe remains latent within him. Right. So in 
So the, the, the universe evolves out of God, the universe and the souls evolve out of God, and then the, the, they, they remain for some time and then they come back into the body of God. They remain latent within him. It doesn't mean that they completely merge back into him or they, or they become him, him in any real sense, but they, they are latent within him. In evolution, and when creation begins, the latent becomes manifest, the hidden becomes exposed. The subtle, the subtle souls become gross and right. subtle souls become gross. In other words, the latent souls that are within the body of God are manifest and they get put into different bodies uh, by their previous karmas and things like that. So, and with the aid of Dharma Buddha Jnana, enter into a relationship, a relation with the physical, with physical bodies. Thus, God or Ishra as the cause includes within himself all of the things which are needed for creation. Thus, Ishra is, Ishra is, Ishra is the only cause of the creation. The world evolves out of Ishra, the God, without the help of any other external factor, right? So now there, there are some other Vaishnava schools which, which don't say that God, so, we, so what we call God, uh, in the Vishish Tadaya, we say he's the Nimita Karna and the Upadana Karna. So he is also he's the substance from which everything is made, and he's also the maker. He's the clay and the potter. So some concepts of the Sankhya system, right, are also used. Now, Sankhya, the word Sankhya means counts, just simply means counting. So it is a system of it's a, it's a system, it's a school of philosophy, one of the sub is one of the six main schools of philosophy that follows Vedanta. And the Sankhya system is a system of the evolution of, it gives a, a whole system of the evolution of Prakriti or the evolution of material nature and how it, the creation evolves. Think about the scientists where they talk about the Big Bang and how you know, certain elements were created in the first microseconds or whatever, and then the universes came into, you know, and then the planets formed and all this sort of stuff. So this is, this is Sankhya. Sankhya is empirical science, but it's based, it's, it's got a Vedantic base. Okay, so this is the Sankhya system. And there's actually two systems of Sankhya. There's what we call Nir Ishvara Sankhya, and there's Sai Ishvara Sankhya, or Seishya Sankhya. So Ishvara means God, of course. So, so we have a, there's a type of Sankhya that says we don't recognize that there is a personality of God, that, there's a, that there is a God, right? Then we just think that the universe evolved. And this, we could say Nirishwa Sankhya is very close to what we call modern, modern material science. Then you have um, science or empirical understanding or empirical counting system of delineating of, of material nature, which includes God, and that is called Saishwa Sankhya. Okay, so there's two types of Sankhya. In any case, both of them have this idea of the evolution of matter. So um, uh, some concepts of Sankhya, right, which is an older school, or let's say a separate school from Vedanta, a separate school or from Vishishta Dreta, but some parts of Sankhya theory are also accepted in Vishishta Dreta Vedanta. It's not that Vishishta Dvaita Vedanta is, is against every, uh, every, other every other aspect of every other school. There are other schools of philosophy which have very good concepts, which, which are also accepted by us. Like that. We, don't, it's just, we don't wholesale reject every other school. Even Shankara has some truths which we can accept. Like that. But these other schools, te we tend to think of them as being half-truths. So we don't accept them fully. But there are some things which, I mean, every, every school has some truth in it, you know, like that maybe what we're looking for, the greatest expression of the truth, right? When we, when we propound Vishishta Dvaita Vedanta. So Prakriti is given a theistic interpretation. The order of evolution of the entities is similar in both systems, right? So what he's saying here is in Vishishta Dvaita, as in Sankhya, the, 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 uh, the method of, of how the universe evolved is similar. The entities, the entities involved are the same. Ramanuj's interpretation of Prakriti, when we say Prakriti, we mean material nature or matter of the universe, uh, it is completely under the control of Ishwara, of God. Besides, 
it is limited in, uh, in one direction only, that is above. But, uh, not exactly sure what that means, but besides it is limited in one direction only, that is above. It is not, it is not separable from the gunas, okay? So gunas means modes of nature. There are, there are, these are also attributes, right? That occur in, in nature. And the gunas are normally thought of as three. Uh, goodness, passion, and ignorance, Sattva, Rajas, and Tamas. The gunas do not constitute it, but they are its characteristics. Right, so again, they're attributes, characteristics of material nature. Um, prakriti. The sankhya, uh, in Sankhya, the three gunas constitute the Prakriti, which, are, which is infinite. Moreover, Purusha means push, the word Purusha means person, it can mean the supreme person. Yeah. It could mean the soul, it could mean God. And Prakriti, right, material nature, are always independent of each other. So although we see that, that we are here in this material world, we are, we, have a, we are associated with a particular mind and body, which is a subtle body and a gross body, right? Still, we are separate from that. This is confirmed in the seventh chapter of the Bhagavad Gita, where Krishna talks about the gross and subtle bodies. Uh, he says, So he says, These are my separated energies. Bina prakritya astada. Astada means these eight, eight things, three subtle and, and five gross, right? Um, are my separated bina prakriti. Uh, so, so although there's a, although they evolved out of out of God, there's a certain there's a separation between them. So there's also a separation between the soul and the body, but they're not merged together. They, they, they appear like oil and water. So if you put oil, if you try to mix oil with water, the oil will all rise to the top. It can't be homogenized or mixed completely in with the water. So the soul and, and material nature or God and material nature are separate in that sense. Um, in Sankhya, the three gunas consist of Prakriti, which is infinite. Moreover, Pusha and Prakriti are always independent of each other, right? Even though they may appear to be mixed, like in the in the body, we see that there's a mind, there's a there's a, there's a subtle body and a gross body, and then there's the soul. The next sloka in the Bhagavad Gita, seventh chapter, after Krishna explains these eight uh, separated material energies, he says, mm-hmm. Jiva Bhuta Mahabaho. He says the Jiva Bhuta, the living being, who is the Jiva, the Jivatman is above these things, aparayam itastvanyam. He says he's above these things, he's separate from these things, right? So the Prakriti evolves for the enjoyment purposes of Purusha. Here, we talk, we can take Purusha to mean the soul, we can also take Purusha to mean Ishvara or God. So it means a person. So um, in a sense, matter is here for us to enjoy or for us to use. Like that, in a greater sense, it's all it's all the divine little or the divine play of God, and it's here for His enjoyment. He creates the whole, the souls and the world, for His own for His own purposes, right? And that is why it is said to be teleological. The Vishishta Greater Vedanta, in Vishishta Greater Vedanta, Prakriti or the body or the universe, right, is the body of God. He, he said this before. He's repeating it again, and thus. There is an absolute dependence of one factor on the other. So we are totally dependent, both, both the universe of, of matter and, uh, and even the subtle elements, right? Like mind, intelligence, and ego, uh, are completely dependent upon the spiritual aspects, that is the soul and, and ultimately God. So depending on the, upon the revelation, Ramanuja with the aid, of a realistic metaphysics created the system of theistic non-dualism. This is the non-dualism. This non-dualism is, so it's actually considered a type of non-dualism, which is the data. Chankaras is absolute non-dualism. Ramanujas is not absolute. It is Vishishta Advaita, not just Kevala. Kevala means absolute. Kevala Advaita is the system of Shankara. Uh, Ramana just can be translated as holistic non-dualism, or it can be specific non-dualism. 
This non-dualism is vividly brought out in the Tattvatraya of Lokacharya. Okay, so here's the Hindi, Hindi introduction. Skip through that. And now we get to the text. But before we get to the text, what I want to do is I want to show um, the introduction from another edition. There's a book by, just get to the first sutra, right? It, this book is also in sutras, right? So let's have a look at, let's share another um, version here. This is a version. You can all see the other version. This is called, this is the Tatpatraya, Tatpatraya also, right, of uh, Pilalokacharya. So this is uh, the, three, the three entities or truths. This, this particular version was published in memory of the 600th anniversary of Manavala Mahamunigo. I believe we are up to, what are we talking about? This was in 1970. So we have passed another 50 years since then. So we are now at the 650th anniversary of Manavala Mahamuni, who was the commentator on Pilalokacharya's works. So this is a, uh, a supplement to a magazine called Sri Ramanujan, which is published in English in South India. The, I don't know if it's still published, but anyhow, uh, the, this is an English adaptation of a commentary, a, a short commentary, what is what it's called here, a gloss, right? A short commentary, uh, English adaptation of the Sarata Malika, Malika means a garland, Sarata means the, Sara means the essence, and Arta means the purpose. So the essential purpose, the garland of essential purpose um, uh, is the name of the commentary. And this is a short commentary, a quintessence of the unique commentary of that great gloss eater, Srimad Varavara Muni or Manavala Mahamunigal, graciously contributed or made by, written by Jagadacharya Simhasanadipati, Mahavidvan, these are all titles. Jagadacharya means um, world guru. Simasanari Pati refers to the fact that he's an acharya. Uh, an acharya sits on a throne. The throne has got lion uh, legs. The legs of the throne are, are like, or the, the throne is held up by lions, right? Simasanari Pati, this is a, the way that the, the throne of, of, a, of a king or the throne of a of a great acharya or a great spiritual teacher is considered is called a simhasana. Uh, okay, so and sometimes even the throne of God or the throne of the deity is called simhasana. Mahavidvan, Mahavid, Maha of course means in Sanskrit great, and vidvan means knowledgeable. So great pundit or great great uh, scholar. He be an Angacharya Swami of Country Puram. So this is a very famous person who was a Tengalai Acharya in Country Puram, but he was very open to both. Bodhagalai and Tengalai um, uh, books and Acharyas. And then the, his, his commentary that he wrote, probably in Sanskrit, it was the essence of that in English is given by another person who is also uh, uh, a great uh, modern Sri Vaishnava author called S. Satyamurti Ainger in, from Gwalior, which is in the middle of India, I think in Madhya Pradesh. And, uh, and uh, in case you wanted to know, the word Ainger comes from the Tamil. I, uh, Ainda. Ainda in Tamil means five. So if we count the five, we get uh, one, Vandu, Rindu, uh, Munru, uh, Nalu, Aindu. Aindu. So Ainda means five. So, what, so people who have this last name, Ainger, it means that they've undergone the, the Summer Shrine of Initiation of Vaishnavas, which involves five things, Tapa Kundra, Tona, Mamantra, Vyadis, Tapanchamaha. So there are these five things which are done in the initiation ceremony of the Sri Vaishnavas. And so there's a surname amongst Sri Vaishnavas, Ayinga. You can, you can apply this to any Sri Vaishnava, Ayinga, because he's a, all Sri Vaishnavas have done this initiation. So Satyamurti Ayinga, with Satyamurti, of course, refers to Sri Narayana, right? Satya means the true God, the true form, Something like that. And this was published in, in 1970. Okay. So there's an introduction here which gives a little bit of, uh, uh, um, which is interesting to read. So let's, let's just have a look here. Among our great pre preceptors or Purva Acharyas, the word Purva means pre, pre, preceding, preceding or uh, previous uh, ancestors, uh, our ancestor teachers. 
who had enriched our system of philosophy, giving a clear cut form and direction to our theological approach. Pilo Lopacharya stands right at the forefront. So Pilo is a very important Acharya. Uh, it is significant that the phrase, samsara bogi sandasta jiva jiva tave namaha, right? Uh, which is here uh, transliterated also, but given in Devanagari. This is uh, when we started this, we chanted the Pranam Mantra of the Taniyam, it's called in, in Tamil, the, the prayer of obeisance or homage to the teachers. So we started off with one for Manavala Mahmudi, and, and we go backwards. We start with our own guru and we go backwards and to up the chain of the Sipha succession, the, the, the apostolic chain, which is the lineage. And uh, so we start with Manavala Mahmudi, the later teacher, and then we get to the earlier teacher, um, Hila Lokacharya, who was the author of the book. His Pranam Mantra, the specific prayer to him, of homage to him, includes this as the last line, Samsara Bogi Sandasta Jiva 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 Tame Namaha, which means that he is the, that he has to do with, um, he's the savior of the souls who are bitten by, by the snake of, uh, the snake of enjoy of material enjoyment here in this material world. Okay, so occurs only in the invocatory sloka ded dedicated to this preceptor. Mm -hmm. so, I'm not, so he does, yeah. So here, yeah, here he explains what it means. In this, he has been rightly referred to as the, the very elixir of life for those who's, who are stung by the deadly serpent of samsara. So this material world of samsara, birth, death, old age, and disease going around in this material cycle, birth after birth, right, is considered, is, is compared to a snake, a deadly snake, which kills us, which kills the soul. And of course, the soul can't be killed, but in, in this analogy, the samsara is like a snake, which bites the, the, the person who is under illusion in this world. So then when somebody, when somebody gets bitten by a snake, especially in, in my country, Australia, if you get bitten by a snake, you go to the doctor and the doctor has an anti-venin or an anti-venom, right? Which, which is, uh, which is in, administered to you, which is, here he calls it the elixir of life, but it's the medicine which cures the snake bite, the poison of the snake bite. Okay, so he is, he is the very, Pillai uh, Lokacharya is considered to be that very anti-venom that we need to cure the snake bite that we have in this material world of the illusion of being enjoyers here in this material world. Okay, so more than his profound knowledge, what really elevated him to such a lofty stature were his numerous texts, and we talked about the 18 texts that he wrote, um, uh, which are called Rahasigrantas, texts of esoteric, esoteric knowledge, uh, uh, through which he opened, he opened up vast treasures of essential knowledge, paving the way for the self-centered, the self-centered struggling householders, right? That's a good description of all of us, um, caught up in the eddies and whirlpools of samsara. So here samsara is being compared to a maelstrom, uh, a, a uh, you know, a raging, torrent of water that goes around in, in, whirl, in a whirlpool like a vortex, sucking us down um, of samsara and become, become, to become ardent aspirants of moksha. So he's going to help us uh, give up our material thinking and be aspirants actually for liberation and, uh, and making those or, already aspiring for moksha beam with the halo of the released souls so we are, we are still trapped in this material world, but because of reading his, his books, we become just like the residents of Vaikuntha, the eternally freed souls, and we beam with that sort of a, um, a effulgence or halo, and so on, in the ascending scale of spiritual progress. Even this huge reservoir of knowledge would have become unavail unavailing had it not been for the floodgates graciously provided by Srimad Varavara Muni. So now he is praising Varavara Muni or Manavala Muni, the commentator on Pila Lokacharya's works, saying that, that uh, Pila Lokacharya gave us this, he gave us this medicine in the form of spiritual knowledge in his books, 
but really that would it would never have come to light it would never have been used or never have been got to got to us without the, the explanation that Varavara Muni or Manavalaman Muni had given with his commentary for an effective flow of all that knowledge through his lucid commentary sweet and scintillating okay even an even more productive channel of distribution bringing within its purview a much larger area of contacts contacts is found in the sarata malika or sarata dipika okay malika means a gar like a garland dipika means a light so you can take your your pick of the of the title of the of the commentary which is given by Vidyananda Nandacharya. here the uh, the translator here Satyamurti Iyengar is just is just saying that this is a great commentary also on both Pillai Lokacharya's original work and Manavala Mamani's commentary. So there's also another sub commentary. So this is the way of of Sanskrit books and 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 uh, it's there in all traditions that an original Acharya will write an original work. Uh, he may Acharya may also write commentaries on on other works or other main works like the Prasthana Tri that we talked about, the Gita, the Upanishads, and the Brahma Sutras. So an Acharya may, may write commentaries directly on those, or an Acharya may also write sub-commentaries on the commentaries of the previous Acharyas, of the previous Gurus. And, uh, and in this case, Hilalok Acharya wrote the Mula, or the original text of Tattvatrayam. Manavala Mamani wrote a commentary on it, and this Hibiananda Acharya wrote another short commentary on that, commentary and the original text. So in, in, in every case, each of the, each of the uh, different acharyas has, has given us more understanding of the original text and the original uh, concepts. So, and several other easily assimilable commentaries graciously contributed by Jagadacharya Simhasanadi Pati Mahavidvan P.B. Anandacharya Swami. The English rendering of Mamukshapati and Tattvatraya as presented by this mighty savant is now before the public as part of the book project announced by him sometimes back in connection uh, with the ensuing uh, sex centenary, he means uh, uh, the, uh, the, the 600th anniversary celebrations of Sri Manavalama Munigal. It is noteworthy that the knowledge, we just passed the 650th, right, in, two, in, in 2020, uh, anniversary of, of uh, Manavala Bamun. And, uh, and uh, of course, it, in 2017, we passed the, the uh, thousandth anniversary of Ramanuja. It is, um, it is noteworthy that the knowledge of the Tatpatraya, the three entities or truths or fundamental principles, namely Chit, sentient beings or individual souls, Achit, non-sentient matter, and Ishwara, the Supreme Lord, their salient features and interrelation is as indispensable as that of the three mystery laws, Rahasya Grantas, Tiru Mantra, Dwayam, and Charma Sloka compri comprised in Mamukshapati. So we're, we have other classes on Mamukshapati, which is another book by Pillai Lokacharya, also has a commentary by Manavala Mahamuni. And that, that book deals, as we know, with the three mantras, the Tira Mantra, Astakshara Mantra, Om Namo Narayanaya, the Dwaya Mantra, which is made of two sections, Sri Man Narayana Tarno Shanam Papadye, Shmati Narayanaya Namaha, and the 66th verse of the 18th chapter of Bhagavad Gita, the Charma, Krishna Charma Sloka, Sarvada Mam Paritetya, Mami Kam Shanam Paja, Hamta Sarva Pibyo Mokshi Shini Masajaha. So, what he's saying here is he's saying it's just as important to know about Chitta, Chitta, and Ishwara as it is to know about these three mantras which are given in the initiation of three Vaishnavas. <clears throat> Num, uh, section three here, Tattva Jnana, Tattva Jnana Muktihi, Tattva Jnana Muktihi is the, is the creed of Vedantins. In fact, you'll hear uh, versions of this, this slogan given by Shankara and given by other people who are Vedantins, people who, who read Vedanta and try to study this Vedanta in all its different flavors, right? One flavor is Vishishta Dvaita, one flavor is Kevala Dvaita, one flavor, there's many different, slightly different forms of Vedanta. Um, but, but the Vedantins in general tend to say, uh, they tend to say uh, Gyanan or Gyanat, which is the uh, ablative case of jnana, which means uh, singular ablative, uh, panchami vibhakti, um, of the word for knowledge, 
it means from knowledge. Jnanan or Jnanat means from knowledge. Muktihi, liberation comes from knowledge. So here he's saying, Tattva Jnanam Muktihi, from the knowledge of truth comes liberation. So when we have the true knowledge, we are actually liberated. That is the cause of liberation, true knowledge. The exact import of the Tattvas, the principles that we're talking about here, which are three in this case, their classification and composition, how a knowledge therefore results in moksha, and what exactly is meant by moksha, have been explained in this book, meaning Tattvatraya, which is, as it were, a manual of Vishishtadvaita system of philosophy. Right. So this was just the introduction written by S. Satyamurti Iyengar to his translation. Now, to be clear, he hasn't translated Tattvatraya. He hasn't translated the commentary of Manavala Mamani. He's translated the Sarata Deepika or the Sarata Malika, right, of, uh, of P.B. Anangacharya, this, this uh, other scholar of Kanchipuram, which is a, he's a great scholar uh, about 100 years ago um, in Kanchipuram, and uh, which is the, is the gloss. Okay, so we're also going to have a look at this as we go through Tattva Triya in the other edition. And so he starts out with a, a, uh, a salutation that we started at the beginning of this session. Uh, the first one is Salut Sri Shailesha Dayapatram Dibakyadi Guranavam Yithindam Paravam Bande Ramajama Taramonim, which is the, uh, the homage mantra to the, uh, the respects to Manavala Mahamuni. Salutations to Manavala Mahamuni, the repository of Sri Shailesha's grace. His guru was called Sri Shailesha. So we said we we all it's it's it pleases the acharya no end if you if you make a prayer to him and mention his acharya then he becomes most if you want to please a, a teacher when you make a when you when the student makes a prayer to the teacher and he offers his respects to his teacher if he if he if he offers respects to his the teacher's teacher then the teacher definitely becomes pleased if you just simply praise a teacher He's not as pleased as if you praise his teacher. So that's the system. So that's why I say the repository of Sri Shalis is grace like that. That's why we always say Asman Guru Bhyana Maha, I offer my respects to all my teachers. And I also offer respects to their teachers, Asman Parama Guru Bhyana Maha, Asman Sarva Guru Bhyana Maha, all the teachers like that. So the ocean, so the repository of Sri Shalis is grace, the ocean of devotion and other auspicious qualities and the very personification of the love for Ramanuja, of love for Ramanuja, the Prince of Ascetics. The Prince of Ascetics is, uh, is Yati Raja, Yati Raja, which actually means a king of a king of sannyasis. Okay. So that's the first, that was the first sloka that we chanted. The next one was this, the, the particular sloka or pranams to uh, Lokacharya himself, Pili Lokacharya himself. Salutation to the great preceptor Lokacharya son of Krishnapada. So here he's mentioned his father, um, right? Uh, and savior of those stung by the deadly serpent of samsara. Okay. So now we're going to go back to the other, uh, the other um, edition. And let's start the actual sutras. And we'll come back here and look, to, and look at the gloss uh, from time to time. Okay, so it starts out here, Hari Om, Hari Om Tat Sat. <laughs> the first part, it says, Hari Om Tat Sat. Uh, interesting, I like that. They, they, have, they haven't translated that Hari Om Tat Sat, but Hari, the word Hari He, this, all Vedic mantras usually start with this. So when we, uh, uh, the, 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 uh, the, the title here in Devanagari says, Tat Patrayam. So Tat Patrayam is, the, is the, um, this, the title of the book. Right, but it starts out here, Harihi Om Tat Sat. Right, so Harihi means O oh Lord Hari, right? O oh Lord Hari, meaning Vishnu or Sriman Narayana, like that. This is the way all Vedic mantras start. So when you have some people who, this is a very interesting thing, you know, very simple thing, right? Very, uh, uh, you know, how do we know that the Vedas are not meant to? For the praise of any other deity like Surya or Agni or Vayu or Shiva or Rudra, like this. How do we know that Sri Narayana is actually meant by all the Vedas? Well, number one, we look in the Bhagavad Gita and Krishna says, by all the Vedas I am to be known. 
Krishna says that in the Bhagavad Gita. So um, although we may see different names being given in the in the Vedas, actually the whole all the Vedas actually ultimately mean are, are in praise of Sriman Narayana, right? That's why every Vedic mantra, any anybody, it doesn't matter if they're followers of Shankara, it doesn't matter if they're Shaivites, it doesn't matter if they're, you know, whatever. They always start the Vedic mantras saying, Hari Hi Om. Oh my Lord Hari is the way every Vedic mantra starts. Om and the word and the, the syllable Om or Pranava is as it's called in Sanskrit or Omkara, like that is a transcendental syllable made up of three letters, A U Ma. A U and M, like that. They have different meanings, which we won't go into here, but in other classes we explain in depth what they mean. Tat sat, tat sat, sat means eternality. Tat means that. That is eternal. That is eternal. Yes. Lord Hari. Oh my Lord Hari. That is eternal. That he's a, he is the eternal. To eternality. He is eternal. Like that. So that hasn't been translated here. So I just thought I'd just give a little explanation of what Hari Om Tat Sat means. And then we start off with different sutras. So these sutras seem to be in, in pure Sanskrit. Uh, I'm not sure whether, whether the book is actually in Sanskrit or, is, or, or a mixture of Sanskrit and Tamil, which is Pani Kavala. But in any case, we have these sutras. It seems like they're in Sanskrit. Okay, so we don't, we don't, need, to read, but we don't, we don't need to read the actual uh, Sanskrit. We'll just get into the English part of it like that because otherwise we have to explain the meaning of the Sanskrit. And it's already been explained because it's been translated. So let's let's start. The knowledge of the three fundamental principles. This is the first sutra. So we have here the the sutras are numbered at the end of each one, one, two, three, etc. So this is the letter, this is the number one in Sanskrit. The knowledge of the three fundamental principles is essential for those who desire to attain salvation or moksha, liberation. The three fundamental fundamental principles are. Soul, Achit, matter, soul, Chit, matter, Achit, and God, Ishwara. So that you can see that in the, in the, in the end of here. It says, it says, it says here, right? So it says, Mumuk. Anyway, I said I wasn't going to do this, but I will. Tatva, Tatva Triam, right? The, the, the end of the mantra here is Tatva Triam, Chit, Achit, Ishwarascha, right? So for those of you who know a little bit of Sanskrit, if you put Cha at the end, right? It means and. So it means Chit. Achit and Ishra. So Chit and, Ach and Achit and Ishra. Right. These are the three principles. Tatva Triam. So, okay. So, that, so it's, it's, uh, it starts out with a, a declaration, a, a, an axiomatic phrase that says, these are the three principles. Now we're going to explain them. Okay. Good. So continuing on says the word Chit refers to the individual soul. This is the second sutra. The soul has been accepted as that which is different from the body, the sense organs, the mind, the breath, and the intellect. This we understand from Bhagavad Gita, as I said, seventh chapter, right? It is different from the matter. It is bliss. It is eternal. It is atomic in size. It is unmanifest. It is incomprehensible. Incomprehensive. You can say incomprehensible. It is partless. It has. It has. It doesn't have parts, right? It's atomic, right? In the sense of that it can't be that it's very small, but also it cannot be divided. It is free from modifications, right? It is the substratum of knowledge. It is guided by God. It is sustained by God, and it is subservient to God. Okay. So here is given a definition in the second. First of all, the first the first sutra gives us the definition of the three realities or the three tattvas. The second sutra gives us a definition of the soul. Right. So now the third one says, while explaining the nature of the soul as to how it is different from the body, the body it's, uh, and soul, the body, etc., uh, is talked as this is my body, etc. Right. So. So the body is known as different than the soul. Anything other than the body is indicated by this. And the soul is indicated by the word I. So when we speak, when we say I, we're talking about the soul. When we say, when we say this is my body, 
This is the body that belongs to the soul. This is my house. This is my car. This is the car that belongs to my soul. This is the house that belongs to my soul. So this is his explanation here. The knowledge of the body is always with reference to one time, to one time, but the, but the soul is, all, is always given in our knowledge. The objects are many, but the soul is only one. Therefore, the soul is to be considered as distinct from the body. There is a possibility of objections to these arguments, and still there may be counter arguments. The soul is proved to be distinct from the body, even in the scriptures. So the principle here in the third in the third sutra is they're trying to explain that the soul is defining the soul as being distinct from the body. Okay. Why don't we have a look at, and see what um, what uh, Satsumuti Ainger in the or, or P.B. Nangacharya is saying in his uh, version of this, or his gloss on this. Okay, so we have the, back to the first one and two, right? So we have the first section. The first section of the book is about chit or, or sentient beings. So it says, uh, tattva jnana and muktihi, which we discussed before, from knowledge comes liberation. Uh, that is, knowledge of the tattvas or fundamental truths or principles is essential for attaining moksha or, or, or salvation. Uh, this is a creed to which all Vedantins subscribe. So there are many different types of Vedanta, different schools of Vedanta, right? And they all, they all, um, they're, they're all essentially looking for, at the goal of moksha and the, the way to moksha is by this, this knowledge. This knowledge of the fundamental principles, the three, the three uh, fundamental principles. This is a creed that which all Vedantins subscribe. The aspirant to moksha should therefore acquire a knowledge of the Tattvatraya, the three fundamental truths or principles or entities, <clears throat> as the word tattva could be in, interpreted at the time of attaining sal, uh, at the time of attaining salvation. The three entities are chit, sentient beings, achit, non-sentient matter, and ishwa, the Lord. Okay, so this was what was stated in the first. Now it says, no doubt, it's rightly held that even subhuman species such as animals, birds, and immobile trees, etc., totally devoid of the capacity to know these truths, right? So we don't, the animals, the birds, and the trees, and, and the plants, and everything like that, they do not have the capacity um, to, to understand philosophical doctrines, right? Can attain, they, uh, it says here, can attain salvation if only they had the good fortune to come in contact with the Sri Vaishnava and be graced by him. So also these animals and birds and uh, you know, trees and things like that, they can also attain liberation or, or salvation. How do we know this? We know this because we have stories in the scriptures like the Jindra Moksha, where there was an elephant king, there was an elephant who attained liberation. Uh, through coming in contact with the Lord or coming in contact with devotees, Vaishnavas. So there, there, there is, however, no inconsistency in this in as much as the possession of knowledge. So this is an anomaly he's saying. He's saying here that, you know, first, of, okay, so what's the point being made here? The point being made here is that you might have an animal, you might have a plant, right, or subhuman species that is incapable of philosophical thought. So before, in this sutra, we've said that uh, it's absolutely necessary, right? He, he's first started out by saying it's absolutely necessary for liberation to have knowledge of these three principles. This is what Pila Lokacharya is getting at. He's saying, if you want liberation, you have to gain knowledge of these three principles. That's why I've written this book, so that you can gain knowledge of these three principles and thus attain liberation. So then, the, the, then there's a doubt, right? The doubt is, well, even animals and plants can attain liberation, but if they get the grace of God or the grace of, uh, of a Vaishnava, right? So, so isn't that inconsistent? Because those, those things can't have the knowledge of, they can't have philosophical knowledge. You just got through saying that the philosophical knowledge is absolutely necessary for liberation, right? So it's interesting. So here it, he says, um, there is, however, no inconsistency in this inasmuch as the possession of knowledge in question is enjoined on the Sri Vaishnava, the person that they came in contact. And it, it is only the contact with the person so qualified, which will be fruitful. 
Okay, so here what he's saying is like that. And this is uh, uh, also mentioned uh, in, in uh, Pillar Locatoria's Arta Panchigam. He talks about five ways to God, right? We have Kama Yoga, Jnana Yoga, Bhakti Yoga, all of which require knowledge. You know, we have to have some philosophical knowledge to understand how to perform Kama Yoga, Jnana Yoga, and Bhakti Yoga. Even property, even the surrender, the force to surrender to God, we have to have some knowledge of God and of, of philosophy to do that. And the last one is called Acharya Abhimanam or um, Acharya property, simply surrendering to or taking shelter of an Acharya or a proper teacher, right? In this case, the Sri Vaishnava. So if the Sri Vaishnava, if these, if these subhuman species, birds, animals, or, or imab, immobile plants take shelter of a Sri Vaishnava, that Sri Vaishnava knows the truth. He knows the, the, the philosophical doctrines. And therefore, by just by the contact with that person, as in the as in the system of Charya property or Acharya Abhimana, where a person doesn't know how to reach God, doesn't really know philosophical doctrines, but is carried along with the, the guru, right? Because the teacher, the teacher helps him, the teacher, the teacher service to the teacher, in fact, is his way for is his way to liberation, even though he doesn't maybe understand all the philosophical truths. Uh, we could also give the example of, for instance, a lady who is married to her husband. The husband, the husband does everything, and the, the lady simply serves the husband, and the lady attains, uh, you know, in, in, in terms of karma yoga, jnana yoga, and bhakti yoga, the wife is going to going to attain the benefits also that the husband attains by performing these particular rites and things. Okay, so that's that's clear. So that's, that's why it's not inconsistent to say that these subhuman subhuman species or uh, birds and animals and, or immobile um, plants you know, can also attain liberation. And how is that in, not inconsistent with this idea that we have to have knowledge or philosophical knowledge to attain liberation? Okay. So there is, in, however, no inconsistency in this in as much as the possession of knowledge in question is enjoined on the Sri Vaishnava, right? And it is only the contact with that with a person so so qualified that Sri Vaishnava, which will become fruitful, right? So this is also described in, in Bhagavad Gita by Lord Krishna. Lord Krishna says, "Tadvidi paripatrena paripatrena sevaya uparek shanti te gyanam gyaninas tadvidarshanaha." So a gyaninas, a person who has knowledge. Tattva Darshi, who understands the tattvas, here we're talking about the tattvas, the principles, right? Tattva Darshi, he has seen the principles, he's un seen means he understands them, right? Like when, I, when somebody explains some complicated thing to me and I say, I see, I understand, it means the same thing, right? So in Sanskrit, they say see, when they say, like in English, we also say, I see, it means I also under I understand. So a tattva Darshi, Tadvadarshinaha, right, is a person who has seen the truth, who has understood the truth, who has understood the three principles, right? So, Gyaninas Tadvadarshinaha, a person like this, we should approach, Lord Krishna says we should approach that sort of person, and we should serve that person, and we should ask questions from that person, and that person will impart knowledge unto us, like that. But even if we are a subhuman, or if we are a, an animal or a, or a plant, and we don't have the ability to ask the questions or the ability to, to gain the knowledge from that person, still simply approaching that person is a method, is a way to liberation. Okay. Uh, so, um, yeah, such a person, so qualified, and approaching that person will be fruitful. Fruitful means that person will tell that it will help us to liberation. But then, it may be asked in the light of the Upanishadic texts. Okay, so here's a quote from the Upanishads. Tamevam vidba namritam ihabavati nanya panta ayanaya vidyate. This comes from Paitira Upanishad, right? Uh, I believe it's from the Bhrigya Bali, the third, the third part of Paitira Upanishad. We can look it up later. Tamevam vidba namritam ihabavati nanya panta ayanaya vidyate. Just three of them, um, yeah, I think it's from the, I think it's from the third part of uh, the third part, Bhagavali. Whether no, so, according to this text, it says right. So, 
whether the whether knowledge of Godhead or whether knowledge of God alone would not suffice, and where exactly is the compulsion to know all the three principles? The point to be emphasized here is that the Lord is to be comp comprehended as different from the other two, two entities, right? Namely, the sentient souls and the non-sentient matter. Pervading them, supporting and controlling them as the supreme ordainer and master of them all. In fact, it is this very Upanishad, which, which later says, Bhokta Bhogyam Preritaram Cha Matva Jushtashastena Amritatva Meti. Okay. Here, Bhokta, which means the enjoyer, refers to the sentient soul, bogyam, right, or that thing which is enjoyed, is, uh, is non-sentient matter, and prerita denotes the Lord or the Ishwara or, or God, or Sri Manarayana. Well, well, these are the three entities whose detailed knowledge uh, one ought to possess for attaining salvation. Okay, so that's his, that's his small gloss. So that was, that was quite actually very interesting. Right, so now we're going to go, uh, the next time he gives a gloss is, is um, he gives a gloss on uh, Sutras 3 to 7. So let's go back to the main text because we, we did cover 3, but we'll go to all the way to 7, then we'll come back here and have a look and see what is said about that. So back to the main text. Okay. So in the main text, we had, um, we were discussing 3, right? While explaining the nature of the soul, we discussed that, right? The soul is proved distinct from the body. So, okay, so Sutra 3 was about distinguishing the soul from the body. So now we're going to go, there's the Hindu commentary, and now we're going to go to 4. So, Ajada Chit, Ajada Chit, right? So, Ajada, the word Jada means, um, how can I put this? Um, in, insentient. Jada means insentient, but uh, chip, chip means sentient. Or so, how can we let's have a, let's have a quick look at what ajada, another uh, synonym for ajada in the dictionary is, right? So ajada, okay, ajada means non-animate, non-torpid, not not stupid, <laughs> not stupid. Yeah, sometimes jada is given in the sense of stupidity. Uh, there in the Bhagavatam, in the Bhagavad Purana, there is a, a king called, there's a story about a king. His name is Maharaj Bharata, after which the whole country of India is named, actually. So he's a very famous king. Uh, so uh, Indians t will tell you India, the word, in, you know, they don't use the word India, they use the word Bharat, Bharata. So Bharata, or we have the Mahabharata, the story of great India, of, of, of the great things that happened in India. So Bharata, King Bharata was there in the Bhagavad Purana, and he was a great Vaishnava, but he didn't, he didn't perfect himself in one lifetime, and therefore in his next lifetime he took birth as an animal, as a deer, because he was attached to a deer in the previous life. And then in his third lifetime, but he still had some memory of being a great king and devotee, so in his third lifetime he took, he took birth as a person called Jada Bharat. Jada Bharat. So Jada means means it means stupid so so the reason why he was called jada Bharat was because although he wasn't stupid he acted stupid right uh he is what we call an avaduta an avaduta is a person who is very saintly is very intelligent is very spiritually uh high but 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 he acts as though he's very common and very materialistic so that people won't bother him he simply wants to keep to himself and he wants to keep his spiritual, um, he, he, wants, he doesn't want to be associated with others and be brought down to their level. So he just acts crazy uh, or he acts, he acts stupid like that and people leave him alone. Okay, so this, this is what Jada means. So that's one meaning for Jada. So the other, other thing about Jada is dull. That's what I was thinking of. Okay, dull matter. If we, when we say Jada, we talk about dull matter. So ajada is the opposite of that. So here it says ajada chit. So chit or the soul here is defined as 
not the opposite of dull matter. It's the opposite of dull matter. Means that for the knowledge, right? And chitta also means consciousness and means knowledge, right? So, so the sentient being, you can't, you can't be a sentient being and not have sentience, right? You cannot be a sentient being and not have some sort of knowledge. In, in, in terms of Western philosophy, Descartes says, I think, therefore I am. So because I am, because my soul exists, therefore I think and I know things, right? Because I know things and I think, I know that I exist. I know that I exist. That's the first, the first knowledge that people come up with is they understand that they exist, right? This is the first and primary knowledge that we have. So Ajada Chit means that for the knowledge of which no other knowledge is required, or in other words, it is self-known. So this is basically what Descartes was saying. I think, therefore I am, right? So this is, a, this is the way they say it in Sanskrit, right? This is his, his sutra, sutra four, very important sutra, okay. So we understood the difference between, between matter and, and, and spirit, right? Difference between the soul and matter was described, how they're different in the previous sutra. This sutra explains, and what is it? What is it? The first quality that we understand about after we understand that, that, that the, soul, the soul is different from matter, the first thing is the soul is a knower. The soul know it, knows itself. Okay, so that's what is, is there in the fourth sutra. Now, the fifth one says, bliss means happiness, right? Ananda swarupatvam, right? Ananda means bliss. Bliss means happiness. After waking from sleep, a state of bliss is postulated because the man has slept. The man who has slept states, I slept well. I slept well. Right? So um, we understand happiness and we understand distress. Right? This is the second thing that we understand. The first thing we understand is that we exist. First thing we understand is that we exist. Right? I think therefore I am. The second thing we understand is pleasure and pain, happiness and distress, heat and cold. We start to understand these things. Right? So we understand. We understand. Now, some people, some people think there are some philosophies out there, pretty basic philosophies, where they say when you sleep, you don't exist. You have no, of course, people, some people dream, but some people don't dream. And when you don't dream, you could, you could conceive that. Yesterday I was a person, today I'm a person, and when I was asleep, I was a non-person. But the soul didn't exist or something for that time. How did that happen? You know, there's uh, some philosophies like this, uh, like uh, it's called Chanaka Varga. Chana, chana means uh, momentariness, the concept of momentariness. And this is, there are some Buddhist schools that are like this. They say that, that in Buddhism, they, they say there is no reality to the soul. The soul is, is, is only momentary, exists momentarily. Of course, we, we, we accept the soul as being eternal. Uh, and most people think of the soul as being at least living during the time of, or, or you know, a thing during the time of the person's life. They don't know what exactly where it came from before birth. They don't know exactly what happens to it after death, but they know the soul of the living force is there within the body during life. They understand that. Most people think like that. Uh, in Vaishnavism and other forms of Vedanta and Hinduism, they believe the soul did not was not born was didn't did not exist also existed before birth and also exists after death. Right? Lord Krishna also says this in Bhagavad Gita. He says um, that uh, many many births both you and I have have seen. You know, I remember all of them. That's the difference, and you don't. You you you've forgotten. You have no knowledge of that. I have all knowledge. Um, so the soul is eternal, um, whereas the, the body isn't. Okay, so then there are then there are these people like Buddhists who say no, the soul isn't is, the soul is not even is not eternal, and the soul is not even uh, the same soul. The soul is, doesn't even exist from one second to another, right? Their concept is like this. Their concept is like uh, like uh, uh, of course now we have video, but in the old days we used to have film. And, and cellulose film that used to go through different, go through a projector, 
And it was basically a, a series of slides. So for instance, if I take pictures of a person running, if I take still pictures of a person running and I put them in a slide projector, what's called a slide projector, if anybody knows what that is anymore, right? It shows the, the still pictures one after another. First, the person's here, then he's here, then he's here. It's a, a type of, of, of videography um, of making films is called stop motion videography where people get little models and they change them in certain ways. And it looks like the model has life. This is Buddhism. This is a type of Buddhism, this philosophy. They believe that the soul doesn't have any existence from one. It doesn't have any continuity, right? That each instant, live in the instant. We're alive in this instant. The next instant, we're it's something else. We're something else. There's some other life. There's some, there's some other soul, right? The soul exists momentarily, instantaneously, but not, there's no, there's no, there's no real link between one, one second and another second of existence. Every second is, is unique and different. Yeah, every second is unique and different, but there is continuity. There's continuity of matter, there's continuity of the soul, and, and definitely continuity of God, you know. So, so this is called Shanakavad. So some people, they have a, that, that idea, and therefore it's difficult for them to understand this idea of happiness and distress, heat and cold, pain. Because if I say I, I experienced pain, when did you experience that? You were not, you were, that was not you. That was something else that experienced that pain. That moment of pain, that moment of happiness, that was some, that was some other soul. That was some other, this is a very strange philosophy, but it is the basis of some Buddhist schools. Okay, so here, this, uh, how, do we get, how do we relate this to, again, to Tadvatraya? So here in this sutra, what Pilalakacharya is saying, he's saying that after we realize that, that I exist by saying, I think, therefore I am, as Descartes would put it, right? Then the next thing that we, we realize is we realize bliss, you know? Bliss, we, 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 unhappiness, happiness, we, these different things that we, that we realize, we've experienced certain things. Experience means that there is a continuity. The soul continues, right? If I say I experience hunger, I experience pain, I experience bliss, I experience heat, I experience cold, like that, it means that I'm remembering an experience that happened at a different time to my same person. So not only do I exist now, I think therefore I am, right now I exist, but there's a continuity of me. I've existed before and I will, you know, assuming, right? I make an assumption that I will exist, you know, after this lecture, I'll still exist and into the future. Of course, the Vedantans say we'll always exist, but, but um, at least we understand, everybody usually understands that, that, that for this lifetime, at least, even if you're a materialist, you understand that the person exists. Even if you, if you believe that he didn't exist before he was born and he didn't exist after he's dead, you believe that he exists in this lifetime. So there is continuity. And he gives the example here of a, of a man who's sleeping. And sometimes we sleep and we, we, we don't dream and it's just what we call shushukti. It's deep sleep, deep sleep. And then when we awake, we feel refreshed, right? And we say, I slept well. That means that even in this deep sleep of unconsciousness where there was no consciousness, people moved around us. The sun came up, the sun went down. Different things happened while we were asleep. But we were in such deep sleep that we didn't respond to any external stimulus. There was a loud sound you know, in the kitchen. There was a, you know, in another room, there was somebody walked by, by us. But we were asleep. We we're dead to the world, some people say. Is a type of unconscious sleep, very deep sleep. So although, so how can we say that we weren't dead? How can we say that we existed if there was no, there was no, there was no concept of, of, uh, of any stimulus, right? We didn't experience bliss. We didn't experience pain, happiness, heat and cold. When we wake up, we say, I slept well. That means that we're recognizing the fact that we existed during our sleep. And the sleep itself had a, an effect upon us that we are now revived, right? I slept well. 
I, I now have, and I feel, I feel better that I slept well. Okay, so anyway, this is the point. I didn't want to belabor it too much, but that, that second point about, about the consciousness of the soul. So the third, third, now we're coming to the sixth, uh, sixth sutra. Eternal, right, means that it exists forever in all the three times. So time, time is an interesting thing. Um, time is time is usually divided up into pe in pe people think about time in, a, in 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 abstract ways, but they also think of time in very concrete ways. And the way in which we the way in which we speak, for instance, we use different tenses of verbs. We use a future tense: "I will go," right? "I shall go," right? "Tomorrow I will go," right? Or we say, "I have been," "I went." You know, we use the past tense. It can be it can be past continuous. It can be be perfect. It's perfect perfect tense means it's completed action. So there are, there are different different use of words that we we use to indicate different parts of time. So we divide time generally up into three things: past, present, and future. Right. So again, because of the continuity of the soul, the 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 next consciousness that we have is we have a consciousness of past, present, and future. Maybe we don't have, maybe we've forgotten what happened in our previous lives or before we were born. Maybe even we don't remember exactly being an infant. You know, maybe, maybe our memories go back to when we, when we were, you know, a few years old or, or maybe even older, right? Um, similarly, when we get older, when we get old, sometimes we get senile and we forget certain things. So we somebody comes and says to us remember grandpa when we did this well i don't really remember that you know like that but it happened to us right so there are these three sections to time past present and future and the and the consciousness of that also is a quality or an attribute of the soul like that so here it may be asked how can there be birth and death if the soul is eternal okay so that's an interesting question so the reply is birth implies not the origin of the soul but it's this is pretty basic this is sort of basic philosophy you know um but hey this is supposed to be a book that come that works from basics right and gives us a, an overview of this okay so birth implies not the origin of the soul but its relation to the body so our birth or our conception is our, our being associated with the body. When the jivatman or the soul or the spirit is, is associated with the body. So remember I gave the example of oil and water. When we put oil on top of water, it floats on top. It doesn't mix it's like that. But there was a time when we put the oil on top of the water, right? Before that time, the water was, there was no oil on the water. There was no water connecting to the, to the so there was a time before the soul became connected with this particular mind and body, the gross and subtle bodies that we have. So that is that here is given the name birth. We might we might say conception, you know, but he, but here is talking about birth, right? So um, it's interesting that some that uh, in India. In India, they don't they don't talk about they 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 have a slightly different method of counting birthdays, for example, because what is your first birth in India? What they think about it deeply in, in India? What is your first birthday? Well, your first birthday is the day that you were born. That's your first birthday. Whereas in the West, we have a different idea. You know, we say no, no. Your first birthday is after one year after you were born. You've completed one year. And now it's your first birthday. But no, the, the true understanding in India is that no, your, your actual birthday when you were born, that's your first birthday. And the first time you may celebrate that happening again is called your second birthday. So they have a, they have a saying in India, they say, if you ask somebody how old they are, they'll say, well, I'm, you know, if they're 35 or something, they'll say, I'm 36 running. My 36th year is running like that. So the concept is that that they they if you count the life of the person from the time the soul is 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 um, connected to the gross and subtle body, right? Then actually, 
from conception, it has to be there. So there are some astrologers in India who they will do the chart of the person not based on the, on the time of his birth, but on the basis on the time of his conception. And then there are other astrologers. They, they, have other, they have other timings that they do. They have the time when the baby breathes the first air, the time when the, you know, when the baby starts to cry and, and, and breathes the first air. They have, they have another time which they call Bhusparsha, when the baby touches the earth. You know, or, or when the baby is, you know, there's there's different different times, because in in Vedic astrology it makes a difference. The, a few seconds or a few minutes makes a difference. But anyway, so the idea is uh, birth implies the association of the soul with a body, and death means the implies the separation or the disassociation or separation of the body. That's called death. Right. Okay. So. This is all pretty, you know, simple stuff here. Okay, so we'll continue on with seven. And then we'll have a look and see what Pivyan and Vicharya has to say about these sutras. The soul is considered atomic in size. This is the seventh sutra because it exists in the heart from where it moves out in the sense of moving out, in the sense of reaching out, and its consciousness reaches out and goes from one place to another and comes back again. There's a footnote here, which we'll have a look at in a second. Thus, the in individual soul is, is to be accepted as, a, as atomic size, to be of atomic size. Right. So this is also mentioned in the, in the Gita also. If we read the Gita, it says that the, uh, the soul is minute and it's compared to, it's infinitesimal. It's subtle and it can't be seen with the naked eye. So... Um, it's, it's, it's given the example as of, of being, if you take a hair and, you, and divide it lengthways 100 times and then divide that lengthways 100 times. So in other words, 10,000 the size of the tip of a hair, the soul. But really, this is only just an approximation. The soul is actually very subtle and is not perceivable in a material sense, in an empirical sense. So th that's what's being mentioned here. Now, the footnote here says... This is, uh, he's taken this from Sri Bhashya, the second part of the second chapter, the second chapter of Sri Bhashya, right? 320, 23 to 25, right? So this is, we can look in Sri Bhashya, we can see how this is being described there. By the way, uh, the Vedanta Sutras and Sri Bhashya is a commentary on Vedanta Sutras, right? Um, deal, deal with the topic of Brahman, right? Deal with the topic of, of uh, these topics of the soul and of God and of, of, of matter. They, these, these, uh, these three principles are dealt with in the commentaries on Vedanta Sutra. And the Vedanta Sutra is divided, the sutras are themselves are divided up into four chapters and each chapter is divided up into sub chapters and also into what we call Adhikarnas. Adhikarnas are sets of sutras which deal with the same subject matter. And the subject matter, the subjects are put in a very chronolog a very logical chronological order. So the first chapter is about what is Brahman? What is the Supreme? What is the soul? What is God? What is the reality? What is the world, right? What is the Tapa tribe? The second chapter is what is not. So what is Brahman? What isn't Brahman, right? And then uh, the third chapter is the goal, the means to the goal, the means to the goal of liberation, right? Uh, and the final one is about liberation itself, right? The goal itself. So these are the four chapters like that. And then, as I said, there's different subjects which are taken up chronologically called adhikaranas. Okay, so that's a little bit about uh, Vedanta Sutra. Okay, so now we come to the eighth. Before we, before we move on to the eighth uh, sutra, let's have a look at the Aphidya uh, Namacharya and see what he says here. Uh, okay, so it says here, chit, sentient beings refers to the individual souls. The essential nature of the individual soul is indicated below. It is distinct from the body, the sense organs, the mind, the breath, and the intellect. Right, so we know this from the Gita. We mentioned that seventh chapter. So it has an inherent sense of awareness and is blissful and is eternal. Right. It is of the size of an atom and unmanifest to the senses non-comprehensible in the sense that it cannot be thought of like matter, organless and immutable, 
that doesn't have parts. It's just one thing. It is the substratum, right, or the underlying basis of knowledge and is directed and supported by the Lord to whom it is subservient. Right, so there's a lot in that, right? I think that's very clear. The soul is held to be different from the body, mind, senses, etc., because the soul is the subject matter of the word I, or a hum, while all the rest are referred to as its possessions or attributes, such as my body, my mind, my senses, etc. Right. Bringing out the distinction between the possessor and the objects possessed. The soul being the possessor, the other things being the objects possessed. Even as my father, my son would indicate the father as different from the son. Well, the son is different from the father. And then the possessions are denoted by the word this or these, and the soul by the word I. So this was mentioned also in the, in the, in the vain text. At this stage, it might be argued that because the soul is referred to as I, the expressions, I am stout, I am lean, could also refer to a lean or, or stout soul. <laughs> This doubt is resolved by interpreting these, these expressions to, to mean actually to be just shorthand. This is just shorthand. When I say I'm stout or I'm lean, what we're actually saying is I have a stout or lean body. Right. So we just, we're just, it's, we're just colloquially saying I'm stout or lean. I'm tall or short. I'm fat or thin. Right. The quality of being stout or lean being that the body and not the soul, even as I am a man. So if I say I am a man, I'm the soul isn't a man, right? My body is male. That's all. I am a deva, right? I'm, I'm a devata, I'm a demigod or something like that. It's not the soul which is the demigod. It's the body who is a, who, that's the demigod. So um, would mean, so I'm, I am a man, I am a deva would mean I have a human or celestial body. Further, the soul's consciousness of a stout or lean body enveloping it subsists only during the wakeful period and not during sleep when the consciousness of the body altogether disappears. So what he's talking about here again is deep sleep, deep sleep, not, not, um, not dreaming sleep. Okay. So in, in dreaming sleep, there might be some consciousness of, of certain things. Uh, again, birthmarks, birthmarks, the appearance of the body and death, its disappearance. Whereas the soul is, is an everlasting single entity, and therefore it is that one could, one could claim this is the result of the deeds performed by me in a previous birth. The soul is thus comprehended uh, as different from the body, even assuming that there are limitations and or shortcomings in intellectual reasonings of the kind. The scriptures come to our aid in pinpointing the soul as the entity apart from the body. Etc. So there are some uh, Sanskrit footnotes here. Right, the text uh, the text uh, indicates some of those Sanskrit footnotes. Okay, so let's have a look back at uh, at uh, the main text. Text eight. So it's uh, it may be asked if the soul is atomic inside uh, size and its seat is in the heart, then how it feels pleasure and pain in all parts of the body. The reply is the gem, the sun, and the lamp are at are at one place, but their light spreads in the whole room. Right. So if we have a lamp in a dark room, the light spreads throughout the room. If we have the sun coming up in the morning. The light, it's, uh, there's darkness in the world, and then when the sun comes up, the light goes everywhere. And similarly, if we pass, if we, there's a, if there's a gem which we pass light through, or a prism, right, the light spreads out from that, from that gem or that prism. So in the similar way, the consciousness, the soul is pure consciousness, but its consciousness expands throughout the whole body. So that's how we feel pleasure and pain in different parts of our body. 
Similarly, knowledge spreads everywhere and the soul is able to feel pleasure and pain in all parts of its body. There's a footnote here. It is because of this attributive nature of knowledge that soul pervades more than one body. And it is because of this attributive nature of, of knowledge that the soul pervades more than one body at one time. Uh, except uh, that is, its knowledge may extend to other bodies also. Okay, that's an interesting statement. So this also, this uh, second point is also brought out in uh, Tribhasya, second chapter, text, Third uh, Adhikarana, um, 26 Sutra. Okay. So let's go back to P.V. and Amachar and see what he had to say about that. Okay. The Eighth Sutra. The Eighth Sutra. All right. The essential nature of the individual soul has been set out earlier, aphorism number four. Now the several attributes me mentioned, uh, mentioned herein, therein, are being elaborated upon one by one. By the soul's native sense of awareness is meant that it is in a position to project or manifest itself unaided by external knowledge. In other words, the soul is self-luminous, even as a deeper or a lamp reveals itself and does not need another to reveal it. So we the, here it's said, the, the Sanskrit quotation for that is given here, atrayam purusha uh, swayam, yo, swayam jyotir bhavati. Bhavati is the verb to be, swayam jyotir, right. Atrayam purusha swayam jyotir bhavati. That's a good, uh, a good quote. Okay. So, so, okay, so here's the other point. The other point is the soul is like a lamp. The lamp not only spreads consciousness throughout the room, um, it spreads light throughout the room, which is like the soul spreading consciousness throughout the, the body. But similarly, right, what, when, we, when we see the lamp, we, also, we see everything around the lamp. We see everything by the action of the lamp, by the light of the lamp, by the light of the sun. We see all these other things. We see the world. Right, and we also see the lamp. The lamp also reveals itself. So it's self-luminous. It's luminous, but it's self. It's self. Um, self. The soul is self-luminous, is what he's saying here. So it not only reveals other things by its knowledge, but it reveals itself, which is exactly what Descartes said. He said, "Because I think, because I am conscious, therefore I know I exist." So I've revealed the the, the I've revealed the reality of the soul. Just by the I just by understanding that I do think. Okay, so continuing on back in the main text with nine and ten. Okay, so we have the next two sutras. The next two sutras are unmanifest means that it cannot be comprehended by the sense organs which apprehend other things like picture, cloth, etc. And 10 means, immaterial means, these are all definitions of these words, right? Means that it cannot be thought of in the same way as it is possible to think of matter. So it is unmanifest, the soul is unmanifest, the soul is immaterial. Let's see what the Vietnam Charis says about that. Malavalamam Muni, we probably need access to Malavalamam Muni. There's another edition of this which might give us more, more information. When it is said that the soul is, is of the form of bliss, it means that by itself the soul is blissful and delectable. To understand this calls for no special effort or aid of the scriptures. When a person who wakes up after a spell of sleep says, I, I slept happily, the happiness in question. Should, should obviously be assigned to the soul, which during sleep had no contact whatsoever with anything external. To stretch it to mean that the person slept so, that, so as to produce happiness afterwards would amount to going beyond the meaning of the words in the statement, I slept happily. Such an interpretation would be as perverse as explaining I sang sweetly to mean I sang so as to produce sweetness afterwards. Right, that doesn't make sense. 
does it mean anything? Uh, uh, does it mean anything but that the singing itself was sweet and, and sweetness was a concurrent experience of the singer as distinguished from something produced or experienced after the singing was over, right? The singing itself was sweet. The sweetness um, was not produced. It, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very subtle distinction what he's talking about here. Anyhow, also, we, we see these different uh, quotations in Sanskrit from the scriptures that tend to prove this point, these points. Nirvana maya ivayam atma, jnana nanda mayas tvatma, and jnana nanda daitya lakshana. So we've got, we've gone up to the 10th sutra. So at the end of the 10th sutra, let's leave it here for today. And uh, if there's any questions or comments about the first 10 sutras about the soul, we're in the Chit Prakaranam of uh, Tattvatraya. So we're explaining about the individual consciousness, the individual living being. And uh, there are 114 sutras apparently in, in this uh, edition. So uh, in this way, hopefully we can, get a, we can start going a little faster because we actually had to give an introduction to Pillar to Pila, uh, to Pila Lopacharya and to Manavala Bhamini in the commentary by P.B. and Anacharya. And we also had to go through the, the last prologue or preface or whatever it was of this edition before we came to the, uh, the actual sutras. So now we've gone through um, both these commentaries with, with, with 10 sutras.